your financial advisors. A registered investment advisor, this show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full informed investment decision. This is your money, your wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMV. Now, here's Joe Anderson and Big Al Clopine. Hey, it's a little bit after the hour. Good morning, everyone. Show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. My name is Joe Anderson. I'm a certified financial planner. As always, I'm with the big man, Big Al. Clopine, he's a CPA. Thanks for tuning in. First time listening to the show. Thank you. Al and I have been doing the show close to 10 years, um, helping you on the weekends, trying to make the best financial decisions possible. Ah, uh, what do you want to get into? We got, <laughs> I got <laughs> nothing. What do you got? Well, I've got, I think, Joe, something pretty interesting. And, and uh, this is an article that just came out this last week about avoiding six costly retirement planning mistakes. And, uh, and I think it's important to get into this because we see a lot of these same mistakes over and over again. And uh, some might seem obvious and maybe some not so obvious. But I'll tell you what, we have seen every single one of these six mistakes uh, multiple times. Yeah, you know, it's funny. It's... Um, I was sitting down with um, an individual this week, and she went to a uh, retirement planning course uh, that I was teaching at the uh, University of San Diego. And so she comes in, and she's like, you know what? I really need to talk to you um, because of what you've talked about in the class. You know, we, we, I guess what we, we got into the class is really how to create a retirement income tax efficiently, like we talk about on the show. Right. And so tax-free income was a key component of that. So you're taking a look at maybe Roth IRA contributions, conversions, um, you know, getting more money into different areas instead of just this giant 401k plan where everything is going to be taxed at ordinary income. Yeah. And what we see most of the time is that, all right, we we're, we do what we're told in a sense. It's like, all right, well, here, you have a 401k plan at work, max that thing out as much as you can and continue to let the, the deferment of taxes grow. And then once you retire, you'll be in a lower tax bracket. And when you take the dollars out, you know, so it's a win-win. You get a tax deduction going in. And then when you pull the money out, you'll pay less tax because you'll be in a lower tax bracket. Right. Well, Ellen, and I've been doing this for a couple of days. And what we have found with a lot of you is that potentially you're not going to be in a lower tax bracket. I think most people will, though, because they haven't done the savings. Right. And I think, well, see, that's the thing. So, and I'll just take that theme, Joe, which is this. Everyone keeps being told and reading that you're going to be in a lower tax bracket in retirement. And, and I would say for the vast majority of people, that's true. In fact, the stat we read last week was something like 65% of the people out there will be, their income will be solely based upon Social Security. Correct. Right, which is designed to be maybe 25 to 30 to 33% of your income, right? So if that's your case, certainly you're going to be in a lower tax bracket. And I'll, so that's more than half, right? Right, but the median, I mean, we, we took a look from someone from 55 to 65, right? All, everyone. Everyone. The, what the median um, retirement balance was a hundred thousand dollars. Well, that's if they had a retirement. If, that's plan. if they had a retirement if plan. They, if they didn't have a retirement plan, the, what was it? Twelve grand. Twelve thousand was the median. So, in other words, for uh, everyone, half the people have more than twelve thousand. Half the people have twelve have less than twelve thousand. That's what that means. So yes, median. of course, I would say most people are going to be in a lower tax yeah. bracket. Now, here's the problem, though, is somebody that's diligently saved, and we hear this all the time. They're thinking they're reading the same articles, and they're going, "Well, yeah, okay, that makes sense. I'm going to be in a lower tax." tax bracket and then all of a sudden they get to retirement and they realize oh there's social security maybe they have a pension maybe they don't but they've saved a whole bunch into their 401k and their IRA and at 70 and a half you have to start pulling dollars out whether you want to or not that's called a required minimum distribution and every single year that required distribution gets higher and higher and higher and what we're seeing is for a lot of our listeners probably most of our listeners that have diligently saved it's all of a sudden they realize wow I'm actually in a higher tax bracket in retirement than lower and so that's the problem sometimes when you read some of these mass articles that are sort of designed for the masses but it doesn't necessarily apply to everybody so in this story in this example um, so she comes in with her tax return and she's like you know what I talked to my CPA after the class I talked to my investment advisor and um, you know and I and I asked them I said well does a, maybe a Roth IRA conversion work for us right and so the CPA goes to the tax return well if you did a Roth conversion it would cost you 35% in tax 35% gone 
you know, you'll be, you know, and, she, and then she went on to say, the CPA went on to say to this individual was that, you know, most of the clients, you know, that I work with will always be in a lower tax bracket in retirement. So I don't think it makes any sense for you. And then so she's like, well, I'm so confused, right? So I've been with the CPA for a long time. They, uh, you know, they know our situation and things like that. And they make a healthy income. I mean, um, she came in by herself. Uh, just to, just a couple clarifying questions from sure. the class. No big deal. And um, so she's like, yeah, my husband's an attorney and I'm starting a small business and, you know, we make a pretty handsome income. And she's like, I'm just confused, you know, because what I heard you talk about made a lot of sense to me. And I, and I said, okay, well, the people that we work with have assets in retirement accounts. And in most cases, they will be in the same tax bracket or higher because most of the people that will come into our office want to at least maintain their same lifestyle. Right. You know, that's not saying that we help, we, we don't help people that will be in a lower tax bracket that might not have saved, but in majority where we can really add the most value is if they have an issue, if they have a tax problem, if they need to create income from their portfolio and so on and so forth. So then we, we had some conversation for about five minutes and she's like, well, you just please look at my tax return. And I go, well, before I do that, let's talk a little bit, you know, high level of what you got going on. What do you have in retirement accounts? She's like $3 million. Wow. And okay. I said, okay, well, what do you have outside of retirement accounts? She's like, well, maybe half a million bucks. All right. And then she, we have some rental property. How many rental properties do you have? A couple. I was like, well, how much income are you getting from the rental properties? I don't know, like 25,000 bucks a year. And so I was like, okay, well, let's just fast forward here. Right. She's 58, 59 years old. Okay. Husband wants to retire in about five years. He's 60, 61. Okay? okay. And I go, let's just fast forward. And he's a partner of this law firm that's putting in 60000 or $59,000 in a defined contribution plan. Sure, right. So he's going to continue to fund that $60,000 for the next six years. She's starting a small business, making income. She's going to start funding a 401k plan for her business, right? Right. And I'm like, well, if we just do the math, right? And I go, how much money do you want to spend in retirement? She's like, well, at least 200000 Right. And I said, okay, well, let's take a look here. All right, you got two and a, three million bucks in a retirement account. Over the next six years, if you have conservative growth, still putting in $60,000, you're going to probably have, let's call it uh, three and a half million, whatever, conservatively. So what's the required distribution based on that? And then you want to spend two hundred thousand dollars. Plus, you have another twenty four thousand dollars of real estate income. Plus, Social Security is going to be forty thousand. Plus, your RMD. I'm like, your income in retirement is going to be well over two hundred thousand dollars. I looked at her taxable income. Her taxable income today is under two hundred thousand. I right. said, no, you tell me. Right. With just five seconds of me going through this with you, do you think you'll be in a lower tax bracket or higher tax bracket? She's like, that's ex that's why I'm here. <laughs> You know, because it's the rule of thumb, I yes. think, that yeah. you have to dive in. I was like, it's, no offense to Big Al, he's a CPA, he's been a CPA for over 30 years. But most CPAs will not ask you how much money you have in your 401k plan. They don't need to know that information until you turn 70 and a half. Then that's when the required distribution comes in. And then they'll say, whoa, look at this huge distribution that you had. We should have done some planning five, six years ago. Yeah, it's amazing. You're in such a high tax bracket. And I can attest to that, Joe. So I used to have my own CPA. CPA practice for 17, 18 years, and I would say, and I started it when I was 30 years old, and this, I'm going to tell you something that's probably true of most CPAs out there. Your clients are probably within 10 years older to 10 years younger. It's, I didn't have a lot of 75-year-olds when I was 30, right? In other words, so I had I had 20 to 40-year-olds. Well, your it, client base was pretty, about my age. Yeah, pretty yeah, close to you. Give right. or take. So when I got to 40, I had 30-year-olds to 50-year-olds. It was irrelevant, or what seemed irrelevant at that time, right? Because the, it didn't. It was. I didn't need to know what the four hundred one k and and IRA balances were. It was not part of my tax return. Yeah, you probably told them to fund it more. Probably. Right? Yeah. In fact, I would have. Right. Because of the tax deduction. Yeah, exactly. You're like, wow. Look at your income here. Maybe you should think about another retirement plan. Right. To fund it more to reduce your tax bill today. Yeah. That's... And there's nothing wrong with that advice. Yeah. I mean, yes. But... It, it's, it's actually great advice. However, the flip side of that is if you diligently saved year after year, you end up with a lot of money in an IRA and a 401k, and then you got to pay the piper later, which is the IRS, when those required minimum distributions kick in. Right. And so it's, you have to put this plan together to take a look at a forward-looking kind of strategy. Because if you could just imagine if your retirement game plan was no longer about a number or just about your invest, uh, investments, imagine if you could fill all the gaps 
and have all the answers to a rock-solid retirement game plan that covered everything from A to Z. Imagine what kind of confidence that would bring. This is Your Money, Your Wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMB. Hey, welcome back to the program. The show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. My name's Joe Anderson. I'm a certified financial planner. I'm with Big Al Clopine. He's a CPA. Thanks for tuning in. Can you believe it's August? Cannot believe it. What happened in the summer? <laughs> well, uh, it's, uh, it marched right along. We still got some. See, here's the thing about summer uh, in Southern California, particularly if you live by the beach, there's this thing called June gloom, right? So they say summer doesn't really start till July 1st because of, or it's July 4th, right? June gloom. And then all of a sudden in August, they say summer's over. So by my calculation, in Southern California, the media gives us about a month of summer. Perfect. Yeah. You better enjoy it. <laughs> better enjoy it while you can. You know, oh, I'm going to, um, right after the show here, I'm going to Bend, Oregon. Yes, I know. That's uh, <sighs> one of our uh, friends and coworkers is uh, just turned 40. Yeah. So big uh, big birthday party for, uh, for Danielle. Totally not looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. You you're, should see this agenda. You're gonna wipe. everything on the agenda is like the things I don't like to do. I think I heard. I, I think I heard you're gonna do whitewater rafting. Well, that's like a, a couple hours. Yeah, but then it's like bike rides, <laughs> hiking. What's wrong with that? No, I'm, it's boring. I'm going hiking this weekend. I know that's you. I'm not a hiker. <laughs> I think hiking is the most boring thing ever, unless I'm on like I want to go rock climbing. Oh, that you, would be more exciting. Oh, you want some more adrenaline? Yes. Okay, got it. I don't want to go for a little stroll. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, look at the incline here of <laughs> three feet. You should come with me because uh, Ryan and I are going to hike Mount Whitney on Sunday. So uh, there you go. That's exciting. Now that that is a challenge, brother. <laughs> I want to like get geared up and like climb a rock. <laughs> did you see that guy that went skydiving with no parachute? I, I sure did. Did you watch the video? No. You came in my office when I was watching it, but yeah. you should have saw the end. I didn't see the end. I saw part of it. It's crazy. Him. What is yeah. he? Th- I so don't think I did, would go that extreme. Did he, did he, what, he had hit a little net or something? Yeah, there was like a net. The and then he was bounced like up about a, a mile? 25,000 <laughs> feet skydiver with no parachute. <laughs> That's a little cuckoo, but uh, he lived. That's what people are doing with their retirement. Yeah. Jumping out of a plane 25,000 feet with no parachute. <laughs> no parachute, No parachute, right? no plan. And there's a little tiny net. A little baby net that they're hoping. That net. They're hoping. That's their lottery <laughs> ticket, right? <laughs> yeah, it's like uh, in uh, Kauai. Now, I like to h- hike in Kauai, speaking of hiking, and there's the Kalalau Trail. And if you hike two miles in, and it's actually a pretty rough two miles, rocky and hilly, and but you get down to this beach, and the beach is wild. I mean, it's like I went there once with my kids when they were younger, and you stand at the edge of the sand. I was holding both their hands tightly because a little tiny wave hits you, and you can feel it pulling your ankles. It could suck you right in. And what we were told by the ranger was if you get sucked in and because the current's going to it's going to take you um, west uh, there's one buoy that you got to hang on to and if you miss the buoy it doesn't look very good because the, all the waves after that crash into the rocks and that's that's like jumping without a parachute and that's what we're seeing with a lot of retirement plans is I've got this one little net and you may not hit that net. I hope I hit it, right? Yeah, and hope right? it's not a strategy. Right, right. right? You, you want to make sure. Yeah, look at this segue. Out. <laughs> wow, it seems like we wrote that down. I know, huh? But I'll tell you, this article talking about costly retirement mistakes, the first one, it seems so obvious, but we see it over and over again, is, is not having beneficiaries on your retirement plan or IRA or having the wrong ones on your IRA. And people think, you know what, I... I got married, I put my first wife on, and never thought about it when I got married a second time. But you know what? Look at that IRA. Your first spouse might be on that. And I don't care if you did a trust and said everything goes to right, your second or, wife. Or let's say a divorce decree, because mm-hmm. that happened. That went to the Supreme Court. Right. Is that an individual had an IRA. Now, 401Ks are a little bit different because they're under ERISA. And so if you're married under a 401K, then the spouse is the beneficiary. But when you look at IRAs or 403Bs, right, those are kind of under a different law. Right. And so the spouse is not automatically the beneficiary there. Right. So the uh, gentleman got married, right? The uh, first wife was the beneficiary, got married again, right? And then they had a divorce decree. Right? right, legal document saying, okay, well, no, you get the retirement plan, I, I get the house, or whatever it was. Sure, dies, right? So then the the first spouse gets it. 
the kids should have been the beneficiary. Yeah. And then sue mom, right? I mean, it's just a disaster. It went to the Supreme Court, and who won? The, whoever was on the beneficiary designation. Right. That trumps all. It does Most people do not understand that. Like you said, Al, I mean, I don't care what's in your trust, the, the divorce decree, whatever other legal document that you might think you have, it is on the beneficiary form is what rules all. That's right. And and But how many times have we seen this where uh, someone will set up their own IRA or Roth IRA or whatever it may be, and they don't bother to set up the beneficiary statement because they're in a hurry, and they go, you know what, I'll go back and do it later. Yeah, that's so common because it's like, well, who do I want yeah. <laughs> to be the beneficiary? Right? Maybe I'm single, right. and I don't have any kids, and it's like, should I do my brother, yeah. maybe some charities, right. or maybe you got um, mixed families, Sure. right? So you see that. It's like, okay, well, yeah, it's like the Brady Punch. So you have spouse that has kids from a previous marriage. You have husband that have kids from a previous marriage. And then it's like, okay, well, who do we name as the beneficiary? Right. And then the spouse is like, well, I want my kids on mine. And, oh, well, well, wait a minute. Yours is larger than mine. So how is this all going to work? Right, because it really it can't come to your spouse because then the spouse's kids will get it. So then there's a lot to keep track of here. Right. And so it's like, okay, well, now how do I do all of this? I mean, the benefit, I mean, especially in today's world where it's not the 50s anymore. Anymore. It's not right. The, the cleavers, isn't that right? Yeah, beaver. Cleavers. Beaver cleaver. Cle- <laughs> Leave it to beaver. Cleaver. Yeah, I think so. I right? think that's it. June yeah. and Ward. Ward. Ward and June cleaver. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. And then Eddie Haskell. Yeah, leave it to beaver. Was he was, beaver cleaver? Was that his name? <laughs> I guess. I don't think his first name was Beaver. I don't it think was. they named his kid Beaver. Well, that was I his, think that was his nickname. That was his nickname, but that was the name of the show. Leave it to beaver. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What, what what was going on back then? <laughs> that was, that it was, was like the, a great show. That was the fifties and sixties. Oh, you missed classic. that. Yeah, that yeah. Was, you know, one of my June's favorite in the shows. kitchen. She's cooking dinner. Ward comes home yeah, in the sit there as a kid, watch the show. What kind of trouble is Beaver going to oh, get into today? Who's he doing with Eddie Haskell? <laughs> what are they doing? Eddie, oh, you know the names. Oh Good for yeah. You. Oh yeah. my God. They went bike riding. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and they were not on a sidewalk. <laughs> oh boy, Beaver's going to get it. And, and Eddie, uh, he would bike ride without his hands. On his, <laughs> Oh, yeah, you with no hands. Yeah. Oh, I saw you with no hands, but Eddie Haskell, we got to sit down and talk, Beef. <laughs> right? It was like they weren't in the backyard smoking cigarettes or no. drinking beers. Of no. course not. No. No, they, like, were... <laughs> they were riding their bikes with no hands. Yeah, they they went to school. They didn't open the door for the girl first. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> that was big problems. You know, you know. I, I will say though about uh, the beneficiary, we kind of we kind of make fun of it in a way, but it's such a common mistake. And as a CPA for over thirty years, it, it does amaze me how many people fail to get the message about tax planning and strategies until they make a mistake that costs them thousands of dollars. In this case, you probably passed away and don't even know it. But man, all the, all the heartache to your spouse your kids. You want to get this figured out right now. The secret is to make sure that you don't learn the lesson the hard way. You actually can save more on taxes than you think, but you must use a forward-looking tax-efficient strategy. Now back to your money, your wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMB. Hey, welcome back to the show. The show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Joe Anderson here, certified financial planner, Alan Klopine, CPA. Thanks for tuning in today. Uh, talking about some mistakes, a few mistakes that you're making, simple things that you can easily remedy, but I think there's miscon- um, misunderstandings, well, I there- think, of kind of how, how you go along and set things up. Yeah, that's right. And Joe, I think one of the big mistakes... Uh, well, that- I want to go back to the beneficiary form, too. Okay, cool. Because I more. think what we hear, too, is that, well, I'm going to name my trust as the beneficiary. True. Right? Right, right. yeah. So, and and so th- that seems like a logical thing. So what's wrong with it? Well, I mean, if you look at it, all right, so there's something that's called a stretch IRA, and this might be going away, but here's how the stretch IRA... IRA works. And this is only for non-spouse beneficiaries. Right? Okay, which means kids, kids grandkids, grandkids, whatever. Nephew, niece, anyone but your spouse. Because the spouse, um, they can roll the spouses into their own. So let's say if I was married, my spouse dies, I take her money and I roll it into my own if I wanted to. If I died, she could take mine and roll it into hers. So spouse dies, you, you have choices with the IRA and you can roll it into yours, you can keep it in your, your deceased spouse's name, and there's no taxes either way. It's either just, way. Yeah. You got it. Now, and then there's no required distribution if you roll it into your own, if you're under 70 and a half. Sure. Now, if, if it goes to a non-spouse, so let's say it goes to the kids or the grandkids. So what happens there is that the 
titling of that account needs to stay in the deceased's name. So Joseph Anderson, deceased, whatever date that I died, for the benefit of Junior. That's the titling of the account. That's that's actually right on the statement. Right on the statement. Okay. So it's a beneficiary IRA or a stretch IRA or an inherited IRA, whatever you want to call it. Now, the beneficiary has full reign over that money, right? They could take it all out, spend it, pay the tax. Sure. Or they could let it continue to defer. Okay. However, they do have to take a required distribution based on their life expectancy. Yeah, and that's confusing because people think I inherited my, my mom's IRA, so I wait till 70 and a half. And right, not, or I got to wait till 59 and a half to yeah, take the money or whatever. Not true. In fact, you could be 20 years old. You have to take a required minimum distribution. And of course, it's based upon your life expectancy. And if, it's, if you're supposed to live to 80 years, that's 60 years to go. So maybe it's only 1 60th of the balance, but still you have to take a distribution. Right. And so, and, or you could take it all out too. You could. So if I'm 20 years old, I inherit an IRA, even though it's in the shell of an IRA, I could still take all that money out. I'm fully taxed on it. You don't necessarily yeah. want to do that. Yeah, and I think that's a good point because a lot of people are confused. They think required minimum distribution, well, that's all I can take, right? No, that's the minimum. You can always take more than that. Right. And so as a beneficiary IRA, it's based on your life expectancy. So a 20-year-old, it would be based on their life expectancy, or a 5-year-old, 30-year-old, 50-year-old, it doesn't matter, right? Each, as, as you get older, your distribution distribution's higher because you're closer to death. Now, because of that um, law of letting you stretch out those taxes over your life expectancy, it's a really good thing because you don't have to take it all at once. And then if people take it all at once, guess what happens? It pushes you up into higher tax brackets. Then a lot of that money's gone to the IRS. Sure. So the IRS says, no, you can keep it in the shell of a retirement account and defer it. And it's based on that life expectancy. So, but if I name the trust the beneficiary of my retirement account, well, the trust doesn't have life expectancy. It's an entity, right? So then it's like, all right, well, there's a lot of different legalese and things like that within that trust that you have to follow. I'm not an attorney. Al's not an attorney. I'm a certified financial planner. Al is a CPA. Seek legal advice. But here's basically what you have to consider. Uh, the, the, the trust itself, right? It has to be a legal document in the state that it was drafted. So that's kind of a no-brainer. Secondly, the beneficiaries need to be identifiable, right? So let's say you have a trust. You name the beneficiary of your retirement account the trust. But 5% of that trust is going to the university of your choice or the church or you know um, whatever charity of your liking, right? right. Well, that charity is unidentifiable. The, the, the charity doesn't have life expectancy. So it's it, so it's it's identified as the church, but it, it blows the whole stretch. It blows the be, stretch because it's not a living, breathing person. Exactly, that needs to have life expectancy. So, so that's true. Even if the even if you want to give your church a half a percent, correct, it blows the whole thing. It blows it up. And so naming the trust also it needs to be a look through or see through trust. And what that means is that then the uh, the IRA can look through the trust to see the beneficiaries. Got it. Okay. Okay. And then there's a, a delivery requirement. The trust document needs to be at the custodian. So the custodian, such as Fidelity, TD Ameritrade, Charles Schwab, whatever, they need to have a copy of the trust as well. So it can look through. So there's a lot of different requirements to name the trust as the beneficiary. Here's another bad thing is that let's say you have a beneficiary that's five years old, and then you have a beneficiary that's 70 years old, right? Well, it, the, then the stretch, and if everything else is done correctly, the stretch is going to be based on the oldest individual. So let's say it was a legal document in the state it was drafted. All the beneficiaries were identifiable, right? The delivery requirement was made. And then and there was a look-through, see-through trust. So you, you got all those bases covered. But then you named a beneficiary, let's say your brother, who's 70, and a grandchild that is five years old. Well, the five-year, you know, the five-year-old is going to have to take the distribution on the oldest individual that's named in the trust. So the seventy-year-old, let's say the seventy-year-old is supposed to live fifteen more years. So one fifteenth of the account needs to come out, and the five-year-old also has to take one fifteenth, because in that case, when it's a trust, it has to be on the oldest beneficiary. And that's Joe. That's only if you've already met all those requirements. All the other requirements that you just said, because if you haven't met any of those requirements, it blows it up, and you got to distribute the IRA with within five years. So there's a lot of things to consider if you, because it's easy. It's like, hey, I drafted this trust. And here's the problem though, because IRAs or retirement accounts, they have a required distribution. 
if I have a property, my primary residence does not have a required distribution. Your brokerage account does not have a requirement that the beneficiary would have to take a certain percentage out of that account. They don't have to take anything out of the account. If they inherit a home, they don't have to sell the home or take a portion of the home out. If it's cash, it goes on and on. But the retirement accounts is a special kind of beast here that the money needs to come out because those dollars have never been taxed. The IRS wants their tax. So you're going to pay it, your spouse is going to pay it, or the beneficiaries will pay it. So <clears throat> naming the trust is, I mean, it, it works. And the only reason why you would want to name the trust, if you wanted to control the money from the grave. Right. That's and the only thing it does. If you're like, hey, you know what? This kid is going to blow this money. So I want to put language in the trust to make sure that they only take the requirement out or they can take out certain percentages out. Right. And then, then you have to take a look at, all right, well, what kind of trust? Is it a conduit trust or is it a discretionary trust? Because if it stays in the trust, right, those distributions, if they stay in the trust, what is it, $11,000 of income will be taxed at the highest at 39.6? Correct. So there's so many other things that you have to look at if you name the trust the beneficiary. Well, you do. And I think, I guess what we're talking about is, is a lot of people will name their, their typical family trust or living trust as the, the beneficiary of the IRA. It can work, Joe, as you said, but there's a lot of hoops you got to get through. Now, I will say this. So let's 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 now go to state planning 102, uh, which is there is good justification for actually having a separate trust. It's called an IRA trust, which has nothing to do with your living trust. And you set that trust up in such a way that when you pass away, your beneficiaries it becomes subtrusts, and you can actually have the RMD based upon each individual right. beneficiary. Right. That, that's just, just an IRA. It's only for IRA. It's only for IRAs. It's only for the retirement accounts. Yeah. So if, like, let's say, for example, you've got a large IRA balance and you want to have some measure of control over your kids because you're afraid if they just get the IRA outright, they're going to spend it. Well, you might want to look into an IRA trust that, to accomplish that. But that's different than your living trust. You need your living trust, too, right? For everything else, it's not a retirement account, but this IRA trust is just for IRAs, and some of the better attorneys offer that kind of service. Of course, it's more expensive, but if you've got some large balances in those accounts that you don't think you're going to spend, that can be a really good way to go. Right, and I mean, what we're seeing, too, is that the, the retirement accounts are one of the largest balances that, um, that, that people have. It's worth more than their homes in, right. in, in a lot of cases. Sure. You know, it, so going back to this, it's like the most important investment you can make it's an investment in yourself. It's all about educating yourself to make sure that you know everything that's going to happen while you are alive, while you're creating income, and then, you know, God forbid, if you know, when you pass. This is Your Money, Your Wealth on Talk Radio 760 KFMB. Hey, welcome back to the program. The show's called Your Money, Your Wealth. Uh, my name's Joe Anderson. I'm a certified financial planner. I'm with Alan Klopine. He's a CPA. Thanks for tuning in today. Hopefully you're enjoying your weekend. I know that uh, we are. Big Al is going to head out to Mount Whitney. Yes, hiking Mount Whitney on Sunday. How long of a drive is that? It's about four and a half hours. Oh, that ain't bad. Give or take. Not too bad. That ain't bad. Yeah. All right. Um, we're talking about some mistakes. We've just got to one. Yeah, we did. And we're already almost done with the, the <laughs> first hour, right? So, uh, yeah, these are six costly retirement mistakes. We talked about not having beneficiaries on your retirement plan or IRA or even uh, having the wrong ones. Uh, how about this one, Joe? And this is maybe not so much of a mistake as it is it's, it's, a, it's an unutilized, underutilized strategy because a lot of people don't really know about it. It's, uh, it's called Net Unrealized Appreciation, N-U-A, NUA for short. And what this is is if you have company stock, in your 401k, you are allowed on retirement, you're allowed to distribute that stock directly to your brokerage account. And get this, the tax that you'll pay, of course, is ordinary income, but you pay ordinary income tax only on your cost basis, what you paid for that stock inside of your retirement plan. All the growth goes with the stock, sits in the brokerage account, and you don't pay tax on that until you actually sell the stock. And when you do sell the, the stock, it's long-term capital gain rate, which is a lot lower than ordinary income. And just to give you an idea, long-term capital gain rates, depending upon your normal tax bracket, is 
some cases zero, some cases 15%, in some cases 20%. And then there's this Medicare surtax at certain income levels of 3.8%. Ordinary income tax starts at 10% and goes up to 396 And then there's still that Medicare surtax. So when you, when you think about it, a capital gain tax in many cases about, is about one half of what you pay in ordinary income. And so you got all this money in your retirement account and that's all your savings. And if it's if you have a retirement uh, strategy uh, of pulling those assets out to fund your living expenses, you're still gonna be in a high bracket because it's all ordinary income. Here's a way to get some of that asset out into your brokerage account pay a lower capital gain tax, right? And now you got something, an asset, a pool, if you will, that you can draw from that's very tax efficient. Yeah, it's, it's key. But then here's another technique is that, all right, so let's say you have company stock and you uh, here's how it works is that you take a look at the basis of the stock. And so let's say the basis is a dollar share and now it's worth $10 a share. So you move the $10 a share, right, out into the brokerage account and you pay tax on the dollar share of what the cost basis is. So you pay a little bit of tax, but all of that net unrealized appreciation, that $9 per share, when you sell it, it's taxed at a capital gains rate. Now, Sometimes you take a look at retirement, all right? So you do the net unrealized appreciation. Now you have more dollars in a brokerage account that's going to be taxed at capital gains rates. Hopefully you have other savings outside of the retirement accounts. If you've listened to the show for any length of time, I would imagine most of you now have started positioning your assets to have a little bit more diversification when it comes to the taxes. And so if you can live off of, let's say, cash, or if you can live off of other assets to keep yourself in that 15% tax bracket, you can sell some of that stock and pay zero tax, right? So it's a double whammy. You get the stock out of the retirement account to avoid ordinary income tax. And then if you can keep your tax bracket low enough, you can avoid the capital gains tax. So you can get those assets out tax free to you. Yeah, and it's pretty amazing, Joe. So to give a little example, so let's say a couple, maybe they're living on $100,000 a year, but they've got enough cash saved up that they can use that for their living expenses. And maybe they've got Let's just say they have $25,000 of, of interest and dividends, but that gets wiped out from their itemized deductions. That's mortgage interest, property taxes, charitable contributions, state taxes, things like that. So their taxable income is zero, just in this example. Now, the top of the 15% bracket for a married couple is about $75,000, which means they can sell some of this stock that they moved out of their retirement account. They could sell $75,000 worth of gain, and then they would pay zero tax on that gain. So now this is gigantic because if you had just rolled this to an IRA and started pulling those assets out, you pay ordinary income tax on the whole thing. And we, we've seen people do this, and then maybe it's a, it's a two- or three-year strategy to sell the stock, but they end up paying very little tax, and in, in, in many cases, no tax, because they've been able to stay in the 15% tax bracket. And sometimes, Joe, it's just a matter of thinking about this more holistically, because sometimes our clients tell us that they, um, they want to give to charity throughout their lifetime, and we'll say, great, you know what, we want to do this this net unrealized appreciation strategy, but we want to have you sell the stock and pay no tax, maybe we can do this. Maybe we can give a little bit extra to charity, causing a deduction that will allow you to sell more of your stock and still pay no tax. And by the way, you don't even have to, to give it to charity directly. You can set up a special account at a brokerage firm called a, a Donor Advised Fund. You put the dollars in that, or better yet, you put your some of your appreciated stock in that. Don't pay the tax on it. And the, the, the day that you put the stock in is the day that you get a tax deduction that shows up on your tax return. And then you got this account that you can dole out to charities of your choice over your lifetime. I mean, this planning is so key in regards to you have to take a look at, A, what is your requirement in regards to income, right? So how much money are you trying to live off of for the rest of your life? The second piece of it is then what is the tax implications of that retirement income? So is it all sitting in your retirement account? Do you have money outside of a retirement account? Do you have money into a Roth IRA? If not, you might want to start looking at strategies right, to get money in different pools so that the taxation of that income is going to be beneficial to you. And there's different rules and laws, depending on what tax bracket that you are, how other assets are taxed. So if your CPA is not talking to your financial advisor or your broker, I think you're missing a huge opportunity. Now, when you're accumulating wealth, Right? If you're saving money into your retirement accounts, right? you, you might have a real estate portfolio or you have a stock or bond portfolio. Right? Accumulation is one thing. 
right? That's just save, 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 save. You know, have a globally diversified portfolio, keep your costs low, and then just keep saving, rebalance, tax manage it. But when it comes time to retirement, this is where the ball game changes. That's where you have to take a look at everything holistically in regards to your taxes, to your investments, to your retirement income, to your estate plan, because everything feeds off each other, right? Because if my estate plan is to say, I want to give so much to the kids, right? Well, what kind of strategy do you have? Are, do you want to leave the, you know, people say, well, I don't want to really touch my retirement account. I'm going to continue to defer that and only take the required distribution because when I die, then that's what the kids will get. Well, that's a horrible asset to get to the kids. Right? If it was a Roth IRA, that's probably a better asset or maybe brokerage assets. So you have to start looking at things differently once you get close to retirement or especially if you're in retirement. Right? Interest rates are at all-time lows. Markets are volatile. We're living longer. Healthcare costs. I mean, the list goes on and on. If you're not planning for this, I don't know what else to tell you. Well, Joe, and I, I would say probably one of the biggest mistakes that we see of folks that come into our office is that they truly don't believe they have any control over their taxes because they've, they've just dutifully paid their taxes year after year, but the, it's not true. In fact, you have more control over how much you pay in taxes in retirement, more so than any other time in your life. But you're probably not getting that advice from your current advisors because it's probably not their expertise. Your accountant is preparing your taxes, keeping your taxes low, as low as they can be, year by year basis. Your financial advisor is probably looking at your investments, but no one's putting this together. It's not necessarily their expertise. There is a way, though, to do this properly, and that's by having a forward-looking tax-efficient strategy.